we're excited to launch our Sunday night service this week at six o'clock here on the North Lawn. This service will be the same service as our online service with the same songs and same message, but we will be gathered together here in this place with the opportunity to watch it from the lawn or actually to listen and watch from your car. We're, we're really excited about this opportunity to gather together. However, we've implemented some rules and some guidelines to help make this experience as safe as possible. And we've prepared this video to walk you through what you can expect on Sunday night. The service starts at six o'clock, but we'd ask that you arrive at least 15 minutes early. Entry for the service will only be from the driveway along 19th Street. Once in the parking lot, you can drive up either aisle where you'll be greeted by a volunteer. Please wear your mask when talking with the parking lot volunteers. You'll be asked whether you would like to participate in the service from your car or on the lawn. If you'd like to participate on the lawn, you'll be directed to park in the north parking lot. If you'd like to participate from your car, you'll be directed to a spot from which you'll be able to watch the service. Once parked, turn your radio to 106.9 and you'll be able to hear the service from your car radio. If you're joining us on the lawn, park your car and walk to the lawn. Masks are required if you'll be participating from the lawn. On the lawn and the cement, you'll see circles for you and those with whom you're attending. You can set down your blankets and chairs in that circle. That will be your spot for the service. The circles will be separated in the lawn for physical distancing. We won't be providing chairs or blankets, so please bring your own. We also won't be having Bible classes, so if you bring your children, you're responsible for keeping them in your circle. Also, we know that it will be hot, but we ask that you not bring any large umbrellas or shade structures. We don't want anyone's view of the service to be limited. Once you've joined us on the lawn, feel free to wave at everyone else and have physically distanced conversations. And we know that everyone has varying levels of comfort during this COVID season, so please respect each other's space as we worship together. Because we'll be outdoors and because we'll all be wearing masks, we'll be able to sing during the service. We'll post the lyrics for the songs to findcommunity.com slash Sunday nights, so you'll be able to sing along as we won't be handing anything out. We know that this service is going to be different. We know that it's not going to be like a normal service. However, we do know that if we adhere to these guidelines, if we follow these rules, then we know that it'll be a safe experience for all who gather with us on Sunday nights. If we've seen anything over the past few months, we know that the church is not limited by a building. We've seen God doing some amazing things in the lives of our church. And we're so grateful for that. And we know that God will continue to do amazing things, even as the majority of our congregation still chooses to watch online. But by being on site, being here on the North Lawn, we know that we'll have a great opportunity to worship God together, to see some friendly masked faces, and to celebrate our great God, even if it's a little bit warm outside. If you have any more questions, please check out our website, findcommunity.com slash Sunday nights, or just email me, Scott Higa at findcommunity.com. We cannot wait to see you on Sunday night. Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Rob. Welcome to CBC. We're so glad you could join us for our online worship service. Um, so we're glad you're here. You probably know we're in a series called Bumper Sticker Theology and we're looking at these little catchy phrases that sound biblical, but we're finding out they're not biblically sound. So today's phrase uh, is one I know you've heard. God helps those who help themselves. You might even have said it. But we need to remember that phrase is not in the Bible. Nope. No verse talks about God helps those who help themselves. The Bible does talk about hard work, being responsible, uh, the fruits of our labor, those kind of things. But not that phrase, God helps those who help themselves. Now, Pastor Brett's going to bring the message on this bumper sticker. And actually, he's going to remind us that when we're at our, to remind us of how God met us when we were at our most needy state, that's when he rescued us. He helped us when we needed it the most. Now, uh, those of you, as we're online today, we have pastors that are part of the chat feature 
We'd love to engage with you. Good to have us in, in participate in the worship service. So that's always available for us as well. So today, as we sing to and worship Christ, besides Scott and Ariana, you'll notice a new face on our worship team. This is Brennan Daniels. Brennan is a summer intern with us. He's from Chicagoland. He's a friend that has known Bre Pastor Brett for a while, and he's here for a couple months. So we're so glad to have him here. When you get a chance to see him, welcome him with, in a huge way. And so we're glad to have Brennan with us. And now together, let's gather before the throne of Christ and sing to him. Let's sing. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us for CBC Online. We're excited to worship together. Let's sing these great songs as we praise our amazing God together this morning. When you move, darkness runs for cover. When you move, no one's turned away. turns into praises where you are no hearts left unchanged so come move let justice roll on like a river let worship turn into finds a family when you move the orphan finds a home Lord here we are teach us to love mercy with humble hearts we bow before your throne Justice roll out like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. So come, move. Let justice roll out like a river.
Last week we taught you this new song, Your Will, Your Way, all about surrendering everything that we are to God. So hopefully you picked it up if it's still new. It's a great, great song. So let's sing it together. By the river, run dry. There is no desert, your streams won't find. Wherever it runs, hearts come alive. River flow through me. River flow. I 
God, for that reality, that your reckless love chases us down, that you helped us when we were helpless. You helped us when we were trapped in our sins. You helped us when we were imprisoned by death. You reached down and you helped us. We thank you that when we were your enemy, you sent your son to die for us. We thank you that when we were far off, you came chasing after us. We thank you, God, that you are a God who meets us in our helplessness and then lifts us up, transforms us and changes us, renews us and recreates us, and sets us on a path of living out your kingdom in this world. We thank you so much for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're so glad, again, you're here today with us. And tonight, Sunday night, is going to be our first Sunday night service in the North Lawn, outside. And if you, start, if you, if you started with us earlier on this service, you saw a video explaining. If you didn't watch that, uh, if you go to findcommunity.com slash Sunday nights, there's a video explaining about this outdoor service. So, so just to remind you, though, it is the same service as we're doing now, but live. Uh, it is, of course, going to be socially distant. You can either be on the lawn Bring your own chairs, your own blankets, your own hat because it's hot. Um, or you can be in your car and sort of like drive in. So, and there's no Bible classes, so I know it's going to be a little bit different. But we're 
trusting it'll be encouraging just to gather. For those who want to come on site, we'll be here tonight, 6 o'clock. We'll do it for as many Sunday nights as we think is wise until there's another step that's clear. So Sunday night service starts tonight. So check out the video online so you know just a little bit more what to expect and all that. Well, uh, as I said, Pastor Brett's bringing the message on our bumper sticker series, God Helps Those Who Help Themselves. And he's actually going to help us see how, how God helps people help others. Like it's, God is helping meet needs through people. And I know I've seen that in my own life over and over again, where God has brought people into my life who in physical and spiritual and material and relational ways have helped meet needs. And of course, that's what God wants to keep doing through us which makes me think of how gracious our church has been with the needs in our community. And the, the Be a Neighbor Drive, where we've had many families helped and blessed with food and supplies. Thank you for those you are giving. And I just want to remind you and invite you, what we want to do now is, besides, obviously, there's always needs for food, but this is the month for school supplies, for backpacks and school supplies that we'll be using and giving to Warrior for Children to help families in needs. So the way this works in terms of these physical gifts is Monday afternoons is like our collection time. If you come by the CBC property, you'll see signs. You'll drive up on the side of the east parking lot. There'll be people there. You can just pop your trunk and whatever you've prepared as a donation in terms of school supplies, backpacks, or if you're bringing food, they will take them out and then be separating them inside the room. So month of July, our chance to come along aside and bless families in needs as they get ready for the coming school year. I am so thankful, too, for your generosity. Uh, we have been very just grateful for God's provisions in our finances as a church. Uh, so thank you. You've encouraged my heart. You've encouraged the, the board, our staff, the whole body here. So in a little bit, we'll watch a video as we just remind ourselves how we do that here. And, um, and just to know this, that as we are faithful in giving, God is honored and lives are helped. And people every day are being impacted by CBC is now, it's a seven-day-a-week ministry. Discipleship is every day. Our chance to grow, to reach out, to help people is every day. And not only here, but of course overseas. Our missionaries are grateful for our stability, our generosity, as, as other countries suffer even more than what we're going through. So thank you for that. And again, if, if this is a new thing for you in terms of the stewardship, the worship of giving, uh, the video will remind us how you can, you can sign up online. You can be an online reoccurring giver. We are deeply grateful for that. So thank you so much. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to lead us in prayer and get us ready for the message and then you'll see a video before that. So let's just pray together. Would you join me? Our Lord God, we come before you and we thank you that you help people meet the needs of other people, that you come alongside the body of Christ. You, you empower us to do your work. And I ask for your continued grace and your help in each person's life in our church family, some who have, ex have extra challenges right now, we pray for those who are suffering. I pray for our brother Sam Williams and as he asks for healing for uh, this, this pneumonia and his struggles. So bless our brother Sam. We pray for, Lord, your blessing on families as they navigate uh, this strange season and what little part of summer there is. Uh, help us in this, Lord. Uh, help us, Lord, as we continue to look at how to bless our community and meet needs of families and those that live in this area. So thank you for generous giving. Uh, and so guide us in the practical ministry that's happening throughout our, throughout our valley. Lord, we ask for your help for us in our country. As we continue to see the pains of injustice, we continue to see the suffering people have and, the, and their experiences and, and what it looks like for us to be in partnership and to, to have your love guide us and lead us out. Um, so Lord, may there be forgiveness in our hearts. May there be uh, uh, a, a true sense of repentance from things where we've had wrong attitudes or wrong behaviors. May there be true motivation of your love to guide us to help reach out and care for one another, to uh, get to know people, to serve each other. So Lord, have your hand upon this country, even as we celebrate our country's birthday last week, and here we are now in coming second week of July. Lord, help us um, make true advances as your ambassadors, as men and women who, who lead forth with the good news of Christ's love and with, with mercy and with justice. Lord, thank you for the CBC family, Lord. Thank you for bringing us together in different ways, in different forms, but you continue to unite us and guide us and empower us. So teach us now 
through your spirit. Help our hearts to be open to what your word is saying, uh, not only for our lives, but for those that you want to bless through us and as we are uh, able to be instruments to help others. So thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for Pastor Brett and for our entire team here, Lord. We ask these things in the strong name of Christ, our Savior, and everyone agreed and said, amen. Amen. I don't know, I just feel like literally everything in my life is falling apart all at once, you know what I mean? Oh, I know, and you're right. And I've been praying a lot about it, I just haven't heard any answers yet, you know? It's like, what am I supposed to do, just sit around and wait? And I want to help myself, believe me, but I just don't know where to start. None of this should be happening. Yeah, something about that just doesn't stick. I know your story. I know what you've been through, and that's why I wanted your advice, but can you just cut to the chase and tell me how you got through it? Nice bumper. Thanks. Hey, community. This is Pastor Brett, and I, I just want to start by saying welcome. We are glad that you are tuning in uh, wherever you are tuning in at today and, and whatever your journey has been. If you're a longtime CBCer, welcome. It is good to, uh, to get together, uh, even virtually in these days, and open up God's Word and learn and grow and worship together. And, and if you are newer to CBC, newer to, to our community, we're just so glad that you're here. We're, we're so glad, and I believe that God has something in store for you. If we haven't met yet, I have four little girls, right? From uh, ages six, we just turned six to 12. And I, I, I love being a parent. I love being a dad. Uh, I, I, I want you to think about some of the kids in your life, whether you have young kids with you now, maybe you're a grandparent, maybe you think back to times past, maybe you're an aunt, you're an uncle, uh, or, or anywhere else that you've engaged and, and, and got a chance to see kids grow up. You know, kids have phases they go through, right? And it always strikes me to watch them go through these different phases. There's not a yes phase, at least my girls, that we didn't have a yes phase. Yes, daddy, yes, daddy, yes, daddy. But there's a no phase, right? No, 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 right? There's not a kind of self-giving, oh, it's yours, yours, yours phase, right? But there is, of course, a mine phase. Everything's mine, mine, mine. It sounds like one of the, the seagulls on, on finding Nemo. Mine, mine, mine around the house. I don't know what it was like in your household. Maybe this says something about me, but, but, but the I want daddy phase, that was very short. That did not last very long. But the I want mommy phase has never ended, right? It goes on and on and on. E- each of these phases have some, some beauty, right? Each of these phases have some challenges. But one of the, the phases that I, th- I think specifically has, has come to my attention and, and I, I just have found some special humor in is the I want to do it myself phase, right? Do it myself. As, as our kids move from toddlers to small children, I think every kid goes through this kind of a phase where they want to prove to mom or to dad that they can do it, right? They want to dress themselves, Right here, and they want to do their own hair. I don't know about this hairdo. This is uh, one of our girls. Uh, my girls, they may not have been able to do their own hair, but but they always had better abilities to dress themselves than I do. So I, I they must have got that from their mom. I don't know. All right, they they want to feed themselves and and maybe test the boundaries. Right here, use use their foot, use whatever is around them to say I can do it. I can do it myself. They they even want to cook for themselves. And, and even now, we still try to work with what the right boundaries and what the right supervision is for those things. When, we were, uh, when our kids were little, they wanted to do things on their own, and, and they didn't want help. 
even a little bit of help would throw off the plans that they had to show us that they could do it themselves or, or to prove to themselves that they could do it for themselves. And so, of course, my wife is brilliant and she, she caught on to this and, and has mastered kind of the reverse psychology of kids. And so if, if a kid is, is, is unwilling to put on their shoe, she'd say, well, mommy will do it for you. Come here. No, no, I'm going to do it, right? And, and, and all of a sudden they went from resisting putting their shoe on at all to trying to prove to mom that they could put their shoe on by themselves. I can do it myself. Our oldest is uh, tiptoeing into the teenage years now, and all I can hope about this do-it-myself phase is that it continues as we think about paying for college, right? Fingers crossed. I, right, long shot. But the desire to do it ourselves starts very young. But the truth is we put a high value on doing it ourselves, e- even as we're grown-ups, right? Even as we age and, and whatever stage or age that we tend to be in, that there's a part of us that wants to say we can do it ourselves, right? We want to make it ourselves vocationally. I did it all by myself. We, we want to do it ourselves financially. We don't want to be dependent on other people. We want to show our stability, our hobbies, our interests, whatever it is. We, we like to show I've done it myself. Now, it's, it's never that easy, of course. We, we're always influenced and, and our success in life is a, a product of our family, of our supportive friends, of our, of our community and the resources we have around us, even the nation that we live in. But this idea, this mentality, do it myself. I, I, that's deeply ingrained in, in kind of the American mythology. We, we love to tell stories about entrepreneurs starting these huge businesses all by themselves, right, in their garage. We, we love the stories where someone picks themselves up by their bootstraps. They did it all by themselves. And that brings us back to our our series. We're in week three of our series, Bumper Sticker Theology. And this series was born out of a a realization that much of what we commonly can think of as, as good theology is really just not found in Scripture at all, right? It, it, more than anything, it's popular thinking or, or it's something that, that, you know, a catchy phrase that we found on Twitter or the kind of thing that we could smack onto a bumper sticker but isn't actually the Word of God. Uh, I, I think the, the best question that has been introduced in this series is, is it biblically sound or does it just sound biblical? Today's bumper sticker saying goes along with this phase that we experience and this mythology that we continue to live in, do it myself. And and the phrase is this, God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I I don't want to embarrass each other um, for for those of us who, who might think that is in the Bible. But the truth is, it's not in the Bible, that, that phrase is not a biblical phrase. It's nowhere to be found in Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, Greek, Hebrew, doesn't matter, translation, it's, it's not in there. And yet, surveys say, again and again, that Americans believe that it's actually in the Bible, right? It's a, it's a part of Scripture. We tend to nod our heads and think when, when somebody says it, tend to say, yeah, that makes sense, yeah, amen to that, that that's... That's the kind of core truth that we believe, one of those principles that sometimes we assume is scriptural. In fact, Barna, Barna Research Group, they did a study a few years back and found that, get this, 70% of Americans believe that that phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is found in the Christian scriptures. 70% of us tend to believe that that phrase is scripture, and so we believe it, right? We, 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 we have confidence when somebody says it and we say, yes, that's the way it is, or, or when we uh, use it to, to kind of frame or tell our own narrative, our own story about how we worked so hard. It, it just kind of makes sense to us, and so with confidence, we can say, we often say, God helps those who help themselves, but it might sound biblical, but it's not biblically sound. It, it's not found anywhere in scripture. What, what I start to think, the question I ask myself is, look, there are plenty of things, plenty of statements that are found in scripture that we don't quote, 
so why do we want to quote this one so bad? I, I don't know about you, but when I search my own heart, I think that some of it is because I want to know that, that I've made it on my own. I think that's part of our, our culture. We want to know that we've done it. And if others would just do what we did, if they would put in the hard work, if they would put in the hours, if they had the grit, then their outcomes would be better like ours because we helped ourselves and God met us there and helped us. So sometimes we, we think that we've done it on our own and, and we over, overlook maybe the, the blessings that God has given us or, or the ways that our community has provided and helped us or our family. Or, or sometimes, I think the second thing that some of us might think is, is we want to say this because it helps us so we don't have to feel responsible to help others. Right? Sometimes God helps those who, helps, who help themselves can kind of be our way of wiggling out of, of helping somebody in their time of need. It lets us off the hook. Or occasionally, thirdly, I, I think that sometimes we love that saying, God helps those who help themselves because we, we, we feel a sense of frustration for those we might deem as, as lazy, that we might judge them as, as working the system. And so it expresses our frustration. The origins of this saying uh, were from before we had bumper stickers, before we had stickers, before we had cars on, upon which to put our bumper stickers, right? It goes all the way back to Greek mythology in the 5th century B.C. And, and we find this in, in one of the stories that Aesop records. He talks about a character who prays out to the Greek god Hercules. And God, or excuse me, Hercules responds to this plea for help with a charge to get to work because the gods help those who help themselves. That's what Hercules says, right? If you ever saw the movie, my kids love that. Hercules, Hercules. That's what Hercules said. How did that idea come to America? How, how did we kind of uh, Christianize it, Americanize it? Well, that was through the work of Ben Franklin who translated that in his almanac, rewrote the lines in Poor Richard's Almanac in 1736, God helps those who help themselves. And ever since, that's been a part of our mythology, a part of our, our, our values. Too often, 70% of us, we've, we've actually thought that was Scripture itself. So this might explain why so many Americans cling to this statement, but, but why do Christians think that it's a part of Scripture? I can't say exactly. I, I think it just kind of has that proverbial ring to it that, that make us think that this must be a proverb found somewhere or a teaching found somewhere. Uh, I think my best guess is, is maybe it, it sounds somewhat similar to what the Apostle Paul tells the church in the city of Thessaloniki, Thessalonica. He tells them, hey, in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Now, if you've been following along in this series, we've mentioned before that, that one of the most basic principles to understanding the Bible well, to interpreting Scripture, is context. Right? Context is king. Whenever we take a, a, a verse and strip it of its context, strip it of, of, of the, 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 the time and the place that it was, it was used to address and just kind of apply it to ourselves and to what we want it to mean, we, we devoid it of its meaning. And, and so context is king. We need to understand what was happening to which the, the writing is occasioned by. What, what's the situation it's addressing? What's going on in the, in, the, in the context of that church that would lead Paul, in this case, to write these words? You see, back then, the church often had a, a common purse, right? It had a shared fund. Everybody would have access to it if they were in need. It was a way that the, care, the church cared for one Another, and in this situation, it seems like there were people who were slacking in their work. They were not contributing to the common fund, and they were totally relying off the efforts of others. Scholars think that, that most likely there were some who, who were so convinced that the coming of the return of Jesus would come any moment now, they just gave up 
working. And they began to just pull and pull and pull from this shared fund. Notice Paul is, is not saying, look, everybody needs to get out and to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and to make it work on your own. No, he calls these Christians out, but he does so by setting up a, a healthy boundary here, right? He said it, it's a good thing for us to help each other when we're down. We should do that. We should contribute to this fund. But this is not an excuse not to work. This fund doesn't justify not contributing, not doing our part. If we don't work when we could work, then we don't draw from this common shared fund. We don't eat. That's Paul's words in context. So if Scripture doesn't say God helps those who help themselves, and God doesn't expect me to do it all by myself, then, then who does God help? Right, that's the question at the heart of this, this kind of American proverb. Who does God help, and, and how does he help them? Now, that's a good question. And I think that one of the best places to start would be in the book of Proverbs. Right, Proverbs is a collection of wise statements, wise sayings. And in the 31st chapter of that book, that collection of Proverbs, all sorts of wisdom is, is throughout the book. And the 31st chapter, it, it actually kind of takes a unique voice. This is the, is, is the voice of a, of a sage mother, a wise mom giving advice to her children, to her son. When I was a kid, my mom would, would say things like, hey, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all, right? Your mom might have had the same statement. She may have had similar statements. And so at the, at the beginning of this chapter, it's, it's almost like mama always said, right? And the author continues in the first lines of chapter 31, mama always said, good leaders don't chase after women. Mama always said that good leaders don't drink too much. Mama always said that the good leaders don't numb their feelings. But I want us to sink in on verses 8 and 9. Here, the, the wisdom of mom gets a, a little bit focused. We read this in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 31 of Proverbs. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. For the rights of all who are destitute, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. There are a lot of places in the Bible. I, I need this word, so I've, I've, I've taken note. There are a lot of places in the Bible where it tells us to be quiet, right? Where, where it tells us to be still, to be slow to speak. I have had to memorize some of those, right? We should be slow to speak. But here we have an occasion for which we're actually supposed to speak up. And in fact, twice in as many verses, the text tells us to use our voices, to speak out, to speak up. God urges us twice here in these short verses to say something, to speak out on behalf of those in need, those who need help, right? I mean, even a casual reading of Scripture makes it clear that God cares for those who are vulnerable. He calls his people, he calls his church, and in the Old Testament he calls the nation of Israel to give special attention to, to look out for the most vulnerable among us. This is a central part of the mission of Jesus as we see it in the Gospels, to restore God's shalom, God's holistic peace in a world that has been that, in which that peace has been shattered. And that can only happen when the most needy, the, the, those who need help, the most vulnerable, are cared for. There are those around us who need an advocate, who, who might need from time to time our voice, maybe because they don't have a voice, or, or maybe because our world, our culture, the powers that be don't listen to that voice. As a part of my seminary training, I, I had a class uh, in, in um, urban ministry, all right? And, and as a part of my final project of this class, I spent 48 hours on the streets in Chicago uh, with the homeless community. 
I, I left with, I think, 75 cents in my pocket from the far south side of Chicago. I walked from 87th Street all the way downtown, stayed the night at Pacific Garden Mission, right? Uh, I still have the, the ticket for my first overnight there, exhausted from walking across the entirety of the city, uh, famished because I had no money to buy food, literally eating McDonald's ketchup packets just to get some sugar. Trying to understand the, 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 the culture, the, the, the fears, the, the concerns, what, what's happening at a place like this. And I can remember that next day, I, I went onto the street and, and tried to find, I got breakfast from the mission, but then we were told to go. Go spend the day out on the streets, try to find some, some resources, some work, whatever you could. And it didn't take long to find that, that the way within the homeless community there in downtown Chicago that at that time, back in the early 2000s, that, that there's kind of an underground currency. And it was bus tickets, train tickets to the subway, right? If you use the train, it gave you 90 minutes to then transfer to another bus or to another ticket, uh, to, to another subway line. And so as people came up out of the subway, they would ask them for their used tickets that would sometimes have as much as 60 minutes, 30 minutes left, and then they would trade those within the community for money, change, whatever they could get. I remember joining a, a friend that I'd met outside the subway station, just, just looking for some change, asking for some, some subway tickets. Now, of course, Within the homeless community in Chicago or here in L.A., a small, small minority, usually less than 10% of homeless panhandle, right? That's, that's not the, the main experience of homeless people. But, but in that moment, I was, I was asking for a ticket. I was asking for some change. I was asking for some help. And what really struck me as person after person went by, the kind of people who, in normal circumstances, and if I were in a different place, if I looked a little bit different, if I were hanging out with different people, would have been very friendly to me, would have, would have engaged with me, would have said hi, would have looked me in the eyes. No matter what I said or did, I, I couldn't get a reaction out of them. I couldn't get eye contact out of them. Psychologists have, have found this and noted this in the homeless community, just how invisible they can feel. They can feel like they don't have a voice. Now, of course, they have a voice, but no one listens. And they've identified devastating psychological and emotional effects from this experience. It may be the homeless, but there are many others who God has given a great voice to, but, but in our culture, in the hustle and bustle of going around, no one's listening. God says, speak up for those. Not only is the saying, God helps those who help themselves not true, I believe that God is asking each of us to speak out, to open our mouths, to stand up for those who cannot help themselves, for the vulnerable, for the voiceless, for the poor, from the, the, the oppressed. Why? Because it expresses God's value of them. They matter to God. We see the imago Dei in people, the consistency of, of, of the image of God in them from womb to tomb, from beginning to end. We value what God values. And so we speak up for those whose voice may not be heard. And, and I think it's important that you see in these verses in Proverbs, it, what else does it say? It says God calls us to judge fairly. And, and what this word is getting at is, of course, we all think we're a fair judge, right? We all think that we're looking at a situation objective, objectively, but, but we come at it with our own experiences. We come at it with our own prejudices, with our own concerns or fears or values. And part of judging fairly here there is to look beyond face value. Look beyond the flash of the very first impression, the very first judgment we might make about someone or the situation they're in. It's really easy to see someone on the streets or someone in a, in a bad situation and really only see the totality of the bad decisions they've made in their lives. Not to see the environments, not to see the, the, what they've had to overcome, not to see the other forces at work in their life. Scripture calls us to judge fairly, to, to, to offer some empathy before we move to judgment, to put ourselves in their shoes, maybe even to hear their story 
before we assume the worst. That's our response to those who can't help themselves. That's what God calls us to do. The truth is, God helps those who cannot help themselves, right? That, that's the truth that we need to hear today. And I hope if you leave with anything, you hear that. God helps those who cannot help themselves. This is the exact antithesis of this bumper sticker, and yet it is the gospel truth. You know how I know that that statement is true? That's what God has done for me. When, when I was helpless, when I was far from God, when I could not help myself, God intervened and he helped me. He saved me. When I could do nothing to, to, to earn, to, to uh, when I could do nothing to, 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 to ask of my, on my own, that I might justify God's love, that I might justify in my own being God's pleasure in me. He said, look, look, no, you are my child. You are my beloved. And I know that because it sent Jesus for just that purpose, that we would see that. May I never forget, God helps those who cannot help themselves. While I was far from God, he came after me. When my relationship with him was, was broken, he came to offer restoration. I love the way that, that John, one of the earliest followers of Jesus in his letters, the way that he puts this. He says, this is how we come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. 1 John 3.16 God helped us when we couldn't help ourselves. He sent Jesus to create a way for us to find our way back to him. He sent people into my life, right, who would point me to God. I, I could think about those faces and those names, and, and just at the right time, God used them to point me back to him. I think you've got those names and faces in your heart and in your mind as well. He pursued me until I was found. That's how every one of us can know and experience God's love. We know the story of Jesus. God helped me when I couldn't help myself. God has helped you. He has made a way for you when you couldn't do it on your own, when you couldn't pull yourself up by the bootstraps, when it wasn't up to you. John continues, and because Jesus, because God has helped us in this way, because God has helped us when we couldn't help ourselves, verses 17 and 18 of that same letter say, this is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers, not just for ourselves. If we see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something about it but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? It disappears. You made it disappear. My dear children, let's not talk, just talk about love. Let's practice real love. Now, I don't think what John is saying here is that if we don't help those in need, God's love disappears from this world. I don't think what he's saying is that if, if, if we don't help those in need, then God no longer loves us. What I think that he is saying is that it is inconceivable that for a follower of Jesus to say that we love God and yet be unwilling to help someone in need. It's inconceivable to the witness of Scripture. And so if we don't, the, the evidence of God's love will disappear. The, the witness that, that is produced as we love those around us is suddenly missing. The testimony that that offers, the encouragement it offers, the hope, the love, they're gone. Often God helps those who can't help themselves through his own people, through you and through me. When we help those who can't help themselves, God's love becomes visible. It's, it's childish for any of us to think, to continue to have this idea that we had when we were three and four years old, that, that if we can just all do it by ourselves, then I'll be just fine. 
It's not true that God helps those who help themselves. No, no, God helps. God specializes in helping those who cannot help themselves. That's good news. That's the story of the gospel. People like you, people like me. And we can honor our God who helps those even when we can't help ourselves. We honor him when we help those who can't help themselves. So this week, wherever you might, life might take you, whatever it might look like for you, let's determine. Let's, let's decide right now. Let's decide beforehand that we're going to use our voice for the voiceless. That, that we're going to judge fairly. That we're going to stand up for the rights of the afflicted and the poor because that's what our God has done for us. Let's be agents of God's love in a world that so desperately needs that way. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for a love that did not wait for us to get our act together. It did not wait for us to pull up by our bootstraps. It did not wait for us to be worthy. But God, in your love, you helped me when I could not help myself. God, we thank you for that grace upon grace. We thank you for that love upon love. And God, we pray that from this church community, that sort of love would ripple out into our city. That we would be a people who extend that same kind of help that same kind of of love in action to our neighbors when they can't help themselves, when their voice isn't heard. God, we thank you for that good news in Jesus, that you are the God who specializes in helping us when we cannot help ourselves. Father, we lift this prayer up to you because of Jesus, in the good name of Jesus, and the power of your Holy Spirit spirit. Amen. All right, guys, we hope that you have a great week. As always, we encourage you to check out our link tree to stay up to date with uh, all the happenings, all the links, all the connections here at CBC. Check out our kids ministry video. And as always, if we can pray for you, uh, send us an email, prayer at findcommunity.com. All right, God bless. Have a great week. Go out as an agent of God's love.